you know, in terms of the innovations, the new companies that are coming out, the job disruption that's potentially happening. Um, but then also, the, I always like to look at the glass half full. So I'm focused on what is the opportunity there, but being very cautious as we move forward. Because I feel that if you aren't intentional in how you use this technology, it can get real ugly fast, right? And if you're not aware of both sides of the coin, that's how we get to the ugly really fast. So I think it's super important, but I feel that if we understand what the positive is, what the opportunities are, then we can focus there, right? So let's, let's dive in. So how blockchain and AI are revolutionizing fashion retail. So I'm gonna take you on a little journey. So let's do this little, I have a story for you. So just imagine you're at home, I'm gonna paint the picture. You're in this, I like the color white. So let's say you're in this beautiful all white room with pops of yellow in the room and you have somewhere to go. You actually have to come to this conference and it's a few weeks away and you're like, ah, oh, you know, going to the desert, but I'm gonna be inside air conditioning. I might be meeting some important people, but I wanna be comfortable. What am I gonna wear? So then you go online and you start searching. But when you get online, your browser recognizes you and starts suggesting some items for you. And then you start directing your browser by saying, well, I'm traveling soon. And the browser asks you, well, where are you going? And you have this conversation with your browser, so now your browser knows all of those details that I just spoke about. And so now it directs you, because you're like, you know what, I wanna wear something sustainable. It directs you to a sustainable website. And then you order this item, and the item is delivered to your door. But it also is embedded with an NFC chip. And on the hang tag, it has a QR code. And when you scan the QR code or the NFC chip, it takes you to its digital twin. And that digital twin acts as a certificate of ownership. But guess what? It also unlocks rewards for that brand. Oh, and guess what? It also gives you VIP access to this upcoming event in a nearby city. And so, not only does it do that, you have the option of looking at where this product came from, who were the farmers who made it, what was the quality of the materials they used, all of this through that scan of the QR code or the NFC chip. Now, the brand that you bought it from can resell the item that you no longer want to use in the secondary market, which means the item was made with higher quality, right? Because I know a lot of you experience, you wash an item three times, it's done. Well, this item, because it's made with the intention of living longer on the secondary market, now the brand is invested in giving you something of higher quality. Not only that, investors want to invest in this brand because they're paying attention to ESG, more sustainable goals, and therefore they know that brings higher profits because over 70% of consumers will pay more for something that's more transparent and sustainable. So this journey that I just took you on all included AI and blockchain, personalization, authentication, digital digital asset ownership, and I didn't even touch on the gamification side of things, where now you could take that digital twin into your favorite game and trade those assets or purchase more assets. All right, so let's dive in into how we did. I started with the end. Let's go back to the beginning. So this is what we're covering. Like I said, we're not doing a master class. We're gonna do one-on-one, and we're gonna allow you to be empowered to take action for those next steps. So we're gonna be talking about the basics because some of you know a lot about blockchain, some not. So we're gonna be going through the basics of blockchain, the capabilities, how do we prevent counterfeiting with blockchain, how do we enhance supply chain, and then diving into AI, more specifically, generative AI. So I'm gonna, this is a definition of blockchain, which you can see here, right? Decentralized, distributed ledger. Think of a public registry, so if you ever, had to go to a registry for your friend's wedding or a baby shower. Think of a public registry where everyone has access to the information on that registry and that information cannot be changed. So why should we care about blockchain? For transparency, security, and decentralization. Going back to that story that I told you about in the very beginning, 
One of the issues currently in our supply chain is that a lot of the craftsmen and a lot of the farmers and the individuals that are supplying the raw materials, they don't exist. They're invisible. And a lot of times they're paid the least and they're working the hardest in this whole process of getting us what we want to wear and what we're putting in our homes. And then the transparency aspect allows us to get to know these farmers, get to know the materials that are going into the objects that we're wearing and bringing into our homes. And it allows us also to hear those stories as well and bring down costs and increase quality. Security. So data breaches are not new, especially in this digital age. There is a story where bill of ladings, where you have to have this proof of ownership when a product ships from one port to another. And one of the things the industry has been doing is try to speed up that process of getting all these, these documents digitized. Hasn't been happening as fast as they wanted to. But there's a case where this proof of ownership with these products that were shipped were used twice because of the digital copy and getting financing. That's a problem. And what, if that digital certificate of ownership was on the blockchain, you wouldn't have had that duplication. So this is where blockchain comes in to help with that. And then decentralization, where the authority doesn't lie in just the hand of one person. We can see what's happened with NFTs and secondary sales and things like that, where the community can get involved, and we're talking about decentralized organizations and communities, and participating in that journey with the brand, with those products. So let's look at some numbers and why should we care? Well, <laughs> numbers don't lie. Um, we see the market size at $11.14 billion just in 2022 alone, according to Fortune Business Insights. And the projection of growth going to 17 billion, all the way, you look at the three digits, 469 billion, look at that jump in 2030. That is not that far from now. And some of the biggest um, industries that are going to be impacted include fashion, of course, healthcare, and we were just talking about supply chain, not just in fashion, but across industries, and finance. We, just, we opened up with Bitcoin, so we know that is a great use case. All right, so let's get into some use cases and examples. So provenance, aka ownership, and authenticity verification. Luxury fashion brands have been leading the way in showing us use cases around blockchain. And again, if you've been paying attention, we're gonna go into some of these brands in just a few moments, but they understand where the future is going with this technology. And to stay relevant, they need to be a part of that journey. So they're starting now. But not only that, this is a disruption in how everything is gonna be done with fashion. And we are going to have more say as consumers in the journey of how products are made and how they're distributed to us. So the luxury brands have the resources to be able to research, do research and development and experiment with these emerging technologies right now. But then also it adds value, right? One of the issues around luxury goods is, is it real or is it not? Now, I lived in New York for about 10 years. I still live very close by. That's my home base for business. And there's vendors up and down the street with your Dior, your Gucci, your Fendi, and these things look real, <laughs> okay? You have to stop and say, well, wait a minute. And so unless you're truly interested in that authentication, you know, people are just buying them because the price is irresistible and they look so good. And who knows, maybe some of them are. Maybe they're coming from the factory and they're overstock. You know, how does the brand know that? And this is where blockchain comes in. So we're going to be seeing more and more of this, not just in luxury goods as relates to the authentication part of it, but in more and more brands as well across the across price points. So we were touching on the story around the farmers and the raw materials that are being used in the products that we wear and use every day. And again, using the technology to track those origins. And then how do we get that information through the QR code, through those NFC chips that I mentioned before. So they can live in the tags. I've seen some items where they're sewn right on top as part of the design feature as well. And it's gonna become something that's gonna be more of the norm where you're gonna be looking for the QR code or looking for the chip to scan. And maybe it's an AR filter. Maybe it's a music, a song from your favorite artist 
that you're listening to through that scan or that chip. So there's so much information that can be held and captured on the blockchain. We were talking about our trips to New York and the counterfeiting. Um, I was in Gold Souk, is the area here, and we were walking by a store, and then I was like, ooh, those Converse are so cool. Oh, oh wait a minute, those aren't Converse. <laughs> and these, these sneakers look exactly, I kid you not, like the design of Converse sneakers. They're super cute. Um, but then we have those that are direct knockoffs, not just close to, but direct knockoffs. And the counterfeiting you know, industry is huge, and we're going to see that continue to be decreased through blockchain. So as it relates to supply chain, not only are we helping make the individuals that are part of that process more visible, but we're also impacting fast fashion where this technology, and I'm sure, you know, especially around 2020, there was a lot of stories around greenwashing and brands just saying, oh, I'm sustainable to get the consumer on board, where now we have the technology that can actually help reduce waste, that can actually help facilitate on-demand production, where if you want a red version of that shirt, it's only made when you place that order. When you want your shirt to fit you the way you want, your avatar that has your digital measurements is that is used to create the shirt so now it fits properly and you don't have to return it right and then we were talking about the secondhand sales where brands are now incentivized to make higher quality goods so it stays out of the landfill and this is a true solution to circularity so if brands are creating with that circular model in mind first they're able to also impact fast fashion and blockchain, including AI, which we'll get into, is going to help in that journey. We're going to whiz through some additional use cases. This is generative AI. So a lot of the images here, the majority of the images in the slideshow was created with generative AI. So we're going to go into that. Gucci is another example of a company that's using blockchain. Um, each of these examples and use cases are slightly different in how they're implementing the technology. So some are using it for supply chain in terms of making the process more efficient. Some are using it to actually decrease the use of energy and then the use of water. So it's not just from a transparency standpoint, it also helps reduce what they're using to create the goods as well. And then those that are using it for tracking and tracing and authentication. Ah, it's like a double click. <laughs> okay, supply chain sourcing. So again, to prevent greenwashing and to help educate consumers because the more informed consumer is going to make a better purchase. How do you convince someone to spend 20%, 30%, 40% more than what they've been spending for the last few years from habit? Educate them, tell them stories, Show them who the farmer is. Show them how they can impact that supply chain. And this is a way that we can do it. So then you have designers that are creating goods. And one of the issues that has come up, especially now, is with AI, how do we protect art? We see the scale that AI can create art, and we know that it's pulling it from billions of trillions of data points from existing um, art in, in our you know, online from our databases. Well, by minting your original design, your idea on the blockchain allows it to get time stamped and protected and it tracks it back to you, the artist. So this is going to become more and more important, especially because of the introduction of AI. How do we protect our art? How do we protect our ideas? So if a database wants to train based on your information, your ideas, and your, your data, it will have to get permission or pay you in order to do that. Right now, unless you close the gate, it's pulling from anything and everything that has been inputted into the database that's publicly available. So this is going to come up more and more as it relates to protecting our data and our ideas. So peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Everyone's heard the rise and fall of NFTs. <laughs> Smart contracts, non-fungible tokens, some did well, some not so much, right? So 
but blockchain facilitates peer-to-peer -peer transactions. When you're able to send something to someone very quickly and tap your phone, they get that digital asset, you get the currency that represents that asset, everyone's happy. And we're going to continue to see our economic system change into this digital economy and digital assets will continue to gain more value and you'll be exchanging these smart contracts, these NFTs, the, the digital twin of your outfit. Oh, I like that shirt. Okay, you want it? Boom. And you're sending it to me via a peer-to-peer -peer transaction on the blockchain. I know it's real. I know it's yours. I know it's only one of a kind. I know how much you bought it for two weeks ago. And I now, this information, when I sell it in two months or two years, that next owner is going to get that information as well. So we're going to see this real, this real interesting, I'm not going to say barter, because you're going to be exchanging value you know, with digital currency, but we're going to see these additional revenue streams creep up from peer to peer just based on digital assets and it being on the blockchain. So in summary, we're saying blockchain technology can be applied to different aspects of the fashion industry, preventing counterfeiting, helping with sourcing, protecting creative ideas and designs, and for transparency and security. So let's delve into AI. And I'm again, I'm going to ask you at the end <laughs> what your thoughts are. So some people have good thoughts, um, feel good, warm and fuzzy when it comes to AI, some not so much. And let's delve into and see where you stand at the end. But I've been using generative AI for almost a year and a half now, um, mainly on mid-journey, but I have used a lot of text-to-text, text, text-to-video, and this, of course, is text-to-image. We're using words to paint an image, basically. And that can be, this is 2D, but you can also do that in 3D, and you can animate as well. And what's been so impressive is how quickly the technology has improved in such a short amount of time. And data has it, depending on what report you're looking at, may it be the World Economic Forum, BBC, or the most recent report that came out this summer, numbers range from 80 million to 800 million in terms of jobs that we will be disrupted by AI. So it's something to pay attention to because it will be the foundational technology for most industries. And we see blockchain, there was a lot of hype, right? But it is a technology that's going to be infused for the reasons that I shared. But AI has surpassed that in terms of, let's say, newsworthiness, because we now as consumers have direct access to the technology. You go on a browser and you have access to ChatGPT, Dolly, Midjourney, and because we're touching it and training it at the same time, that's why it's scaling the way it is. So it's really incredible to see what's going on with AI. So what is artificial intelligence? It refers to the development of computer systems capable of performing human tasks, such as intelligence learning, reasoning, problem solving, and decision making. And with the language models, the, 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 um, the ones that are learning these ML, MLLs, they are continuing to get smarter, faster, better, because we're training them every time we use them. So what are the capabilities of AI? We have machine learning, natural, langu proce natural lang language processing, and computer vision. And I'm gonna start with computer vision and work my way back. So if you've been in any retail store lately, you probably have noticed computer cameras everywhere. That didn't exist a few years ago. But with computer vision, these, this technology is training the algorithm how long you're standing in front of a product. What do you do when you're standing in front of a product? Where do you look on the shelf when you're walking down an aisle? So these are things that are showing the retailer where to place products, maybe what colors to use for packaging. You know, how are you responding to pricing? So it's not just for security why these cameras are being added. It's really to train the AI to more effectively get you to purchase an item more quickly at a higher price. Natural language processing. You, show of hands, you've used ChatGPT or something similar. Okay, crazy how it responds, right? And how better it is now than it was back in the fall of last year. So it, that's only getting better. Um, Amazon is introducing a new Alexa that's going to be a little spicier 
in terms of her personality <laughs> and be more opinionated. Okay, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we're gonna be seeing more personalized, more AI programs and um, innovations coming out that are gonna be even more human-like. And then what's coming down the pike really fast are robots that have generative AI built in. So you're going to be speaking with an actual device that looks humanoid, not just like a little round clock, that will be having conversations with you. And they're rolling them out in some countries for the purpose of being a companion for the elderly to test that technology. But soon we're gonna see these robots show up in our schools and our homes as tutors for our children. And so when we're talking about, we're gonna go into this as it relates to personalization and AI, but when you have this technology, let's say take it out of the robot, that learns about you and your preferences and what makes you happy or sad, it's going to respond and it's going to seem human-like and some people are going to turn to the technology for their assistance, for their therapist, for medicine, things like that. So this is what's coming. And then of course, machine learning, the algorithms continue to get better over time. So again, I like to look at the stats, why should we care? Well, look at the market size, we're at $150 billion. And I mean, AI has been around for a while, we know this, it's generative AI that's really allowed the space to expand. But we're looking at a 36, over 36% growth in the market. And then we see the industries and fashion being one of the leading use cases for AI. Again, these images here are all created with Midjourney. Her glasses are nice, right? <laughs> so Dolly is another popular um, software, one of the, the language learning models that's a generative AI model, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion. And they all focus on creative content generation, images, designs, we now have video, animations, and we also have 3D models as well. So who thought the metaverse, in quotes, 3D immersive environments will be more prevalent now than they are? Let's say a year ago. Did you think that they would be more prevalent? More people would be spending time in the metaverse by a show of hands? Yes? Well, part of the problem of why they're not is that it's taken so long, it would take so long and so much money to create these environments. And so, and another issue was, the problem wasn't solved and how do you get past just the curiosity point where people come for just, oh, this is interesting, like the Central Land or Sandbox, how do you get them to keep coming back? Roblox has been a, one of the successful use cases where they keep coming back. But, this was the problem that was happening, and so that slowed down adoption. With AI, you now can create 3D models in seconds. So imagine what that will do with a 3D world, where before it would take a year, six months, nine months, now you can do that in days, hours, or weeks. So I'm just gonna take you through a series of images to show you the possibilities with generative AI, text to image. And it can be hyper-realistic, it can be fantasy, it can be illustration, you can do black and white, you can do action, you can develop backgrounds and scenes with this, use it for mood boards, presentations, social media, blogs, marketing, ad campaigns. Some brands are training their own models where they're developing their own ads without doing physical photo shoots. Again, is it better, is it not? I leave that up to the brand to decide and the consumer to decide. And it really depends on your audience if that's right for you. But we're gonna to continue to see AI enter into the workflow process and reduce the tasks that would normally take hours or weeks or months to do and then increase output. So this is one of the areas where we're gonna see design, the actual design of marketing materials, images for storytelling, and then concept designs being impacted by AI. And I'm a couture fashion designer, so I'm gonna lean into the more <laughs> elaborate designs is what you're gonna see in the presentation here. But again, you can see it can be very fantastical with a pink forest, right? That will be very hard to capture in a photo shoot. You could do it in Photoshop and Unreal Engine or Unity, but very hard to do in a photo shoot. 
Um, but again, with generative AI, it's something that you can do. And then the more you use the tool, like anything, the better you get at manipulating the words to create the images or the video or the content that you want from the tool. So what you're going to see in the future in terms of who's going to be in demand are those that have those natural abilities or taught abilities as it relates to creative direction, editing, um, if you're a visionary, you know, if you can think really outside the box, how do you push the fold of these tools so your image doesn't look like everyone else's image because these tools are very accessible. And a lot of brands may not be sharing this publicly, but a lot of them have already adopted the tools internally in their workflow process or the supply chain that we discussed earlier. Here are some of the tools that are being used, some of the more known or popular tools. There's thousands of them. But we're looking at Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Artsy, Dolly, Beautiful AI. Beautiful AI has made themselves known for their presentations. Um, Microsoft, their new Surface is going to be, is going to incorporate AI in all of their suite tools. So PowerPoint, Word, Excel, all of those tools that we're familiar with are going to now incorporate AI. So you're going to see this YouTube is beta testing AI and creating videos for content creators, suggesting SEO terms and what topics to create. So it's going to revolutionize how our YouTube videos are being created. TikTok is using AI to determine which video or content was actually created by AI, right? And so now we're going to be running into the problem, is this real or is this not? Um, there is, I'm not sure if you saw the, the gentleman who did a digital twin of himself. He trained the AI with his voice and with his image and he created a digital twin, two versions, to give a monologue. Neither were him. So you can literally, I could be here projecting on the screen and I could be on the coast of Spain and I inputted my script and you would see me like this giving you this workshop and I wasn't the one who filmed it. It was my, I, my AI that did it. So this is what's coming and these are some of the tools. Um, who has used Midjourney? Show of hands. Midjourney? Okay, great. What about Dolly? Show of hands. Stable Diffusion, Beautiful AI, Artsy, okay, and of almost everyone here at ChatGPT, right? <laughs> All right, um, who started using Claude 2? Which very, you like it? It's a little limited, yeah. Um, Claude 2 does not train based on your data. So you can input a PDF, and you can ask it to do certain functions, and it doesn't, I wouldn't be able to pull from the content you put into Claude 2. But by using ChatGPT, you could access anything that I use to train ChatGPT. So it is an alternative, um, and companies now are creating closed systems on protecting their brand IP, so other people wouldn't, won't be training from it. So again, in terms of stats and fashion, and why should we care as it relates to AI, and fashion, we see the numbers. We're in the trillions. I had shared some market data earlier in the billions. When we come to fashion, we're in the trillions. So it's no surprise that it's one of the top use cases and why we should care, because we all wear clothes, <laughs> okay? So it's gonna impact us one way or another. And if you're walking around wearing leaves or beads, it's still fashion of some sort. So we're looking at the market size with AI and fashion. We're in the billions again at 3.72. And we see that growth at 42%. That is a huge CAGR. And it's going to continue to impact retailers. We just touched on personalization a little bit in my opening story. Inventory optimization and design creation. So just to review in terms of blockchain, we looked at how it impacts counterfeit goods, especially as it relates to luxury items. The transparency and sourcing regarding ethical fashion sustainable materials, how we can use it to protect designs and digital assets, and as well as facilitating peer-to-peer -peer contracts. And we're gonna see how that combines with AI. So with AI, personalization and product recommendations. So in my story that I opened up, I shared that you were 
in your living room. I painted the picture, this beautiful white space with some pops of yellow, and you had the conference to go to and you were trying to decide what to wear. Well, your browser that's now powered by AI knows your preferences. It has access to your avatar that has the digital measurements of, your, of you that's already programmed for your avatar. You can see the garments on your avatar and adjust it and say, ah, oh, you know what, I don't like the green shirt. Let me try the blue, let me try the red. You know what, those pants aren't working. Let me try it with a skirt. And you could do this all virtually. And one word suggestions. So inventory optimization, and this is really, really important as relates to reducing waste. You know, most of our clothes today is made with, sadly, plastic. And that plastic has a hard time degrading. And shifting it from one country to another is not a solution. So if we can reduce that and we can go back to the days of higher quality goods, we're really able to reduce what's ending up in landfills. But not only that, think about it. What do you think the plastic is doing to your body by wearing it all the time? So there has been research showing that we have plastic particles already in our system based on how much plastic is touching our skin every day. So this is something that really is important and how it can help us. Design generation. Again, this image to the left is created with AI. You can use it, again, to create products, concepts, ideas, mood boards, and then protect that with blockchain. There is a project that was done out of London, partnered with Google, and they created 40, over 40,000 design ideas. 40,000. So as a fashion designer, creating 40 is a lot, right? Coming up with original ideas. How do you compete with a system that's creating 40,000? And that's where the creative direction and editing skills are gonna come into play. Those individuals, I say the jockey on the horse, those individuals that are able to train the AI, guide the AI, pull out what the customer really want, those individuals that understand psychology, understand human behavior, those are the skill sets that we're going to see more and more in demand as it relates to AI, especially in fashion. Customer journey, storytelling. As a storyteller, as a fashion designer, you can't help but tell stories. How do you convince someone to buy that shirt over that shirt, to buy this color over that color? It's through storytelling. Nike, amazing at storytelling, right? Some of your luxury brands, really great. Coco is no longer with us, but her brand continues to tell the story that we've bought into to stay one of the top brands still in the industry. So AI is going to continue to facilitate that on the front end as it relates to creating those images, manipulating images based on what the consumer wants to see, and delivering that where you might see the red shirt, you see the blue shirt, and you're both browsing the same company's website. All right, let's go. All right, so here's some use cases we'll breeze through. Amazon using AI to suggest products to customers based on their history, as we were saying, which increases sales for Amazon. Um, design generation. All right, getting started with AI. So this is a video and it's not playing, but artificial intelligence is not a substitute for human intelligence. It is a tool to amplify human creativity and ingenuity. So I want to just stress that even though it's a great tool, it's going to enhance scalability, profitability, sustainability, it doesn't replace us. We started the conversation with intention. So, so important to understand the pros and cons of these tools. So we keep human solutions first. Super, super important. How do we stay the jockey on the horse? So mid journey, some of you here are familiar with the, these screens here. But just to take you through like a quick snippet, if you are interested in working with Midjourney, you would need a Discord account and you would need to go on their site and it says join the beta. And that will give you a prompt to join Discord. It is within the Discord app that you create. And it's no longer free, so you will have to subscribe in order to use this. But if you are using it for business, I absolutely recommend getting the highest level so you have unlimited images and the most protection for those images or the, use, the way you can use the commercial rights for those images. Stable diffusion, there is a free version. 
So we're just going to take, I'm going to take you through a few slides on what it's like to actually create with generative AI, such as a stable diffusion. And if you have these basic skill sets, you can apply those to other tools like a Midjourney or a Dolly. So I'm going to take you through this really quickly. So with any of these tools, you're going to, once you're on, this is the browser, and you can use Stable Diffusion on a browser. Once you're in, you're going to input a set of terms or words, phrases. This is a phrase. You could even just put in one word. Some of my prompts are 60 to 70 words long. These tools are really good with camera images, so if you understand anything about photography, you have a leg up. But there are plenty of resources that will guide you to where to start as it relates to prompts. This is a very basic example, horses on an airplane. And I'm using this because you're typically not going to see horses on an airplane. But what would the AI give us as an example? And if you saw this on Midjourney, it would be very different in terms of the output. And it actually, in my opinion, much better. But a lot of developers use Stable Diffusion as a starting point, and then they develop with it, and they train this as a model. So here's, you see four different images. You will then choose an image that you feel best represents what you're looking for. Notice whenever you, choo note, whenever you choose an image, you're training the system. It's going to think this is what you like more. It's going to show you more of what you like. If you do not like any of those images, don't choose any. Put the term back in and regenerate. But if you do like it and, it's, and you want to get it a little closer to it, then choose an image and upgrade it. So out of the four images, as you can see, you can choose, let's say this was the one you chose. You then can modify it with those prompts, those settings there, or you can save it and download it. In Midjourney, it gives you a different set of instructions where you can upgrade it, choose variations, blend it, and the more you get used to the tool, the more you can create more complex images. So here is another set of terms, horses on a plane, on a plane high resolution, and it interpreted plane for the grass, not the airplane. So, and, but it gave more realistic images of a horse. So again, you have to let the, the uh, algorithm know, oh, maybe I should put airplane in next time. All right, just in summary, we have what to consider when implementing blockchain and AI. So under blockchain implementation, we have scalability, security, and decentralization. Under AI implementation, we're striving for responsible AI, and I was touching on this as it relates to ethics, being responsible with the AI, who's training the AI, how do you protect your data within the AI. We have bias avoidance. It's only as good as who's training the model, so that's something to keep in mind. And privacy protection, and how blockchain can impact protecting your ideas and your IP. But then also considering training your own, creating a closed model for the AI. I think something that's so, so important, as, as I keep reiterating, is the balance between innovations and ethics. How do we continue to push forward? How do we continue to innovate? Use these tools, be excited about the benefits of these tools, but yet keep us at the forefront in terms of the solutions that we're creating and how we're using it. How do we scale without making ourselves obsolete? Or how do we use the time that we're gaining with these tools to our advantage and not just doing more work with the time that we saved. So these are things to think about as leaders in your organizations when you're implementing these tools as well. And that wraps it up for me in terms of my workshop, but I would love to take any questions if you have it. I'm Nova Lorraine. Again, you can find me at Nova Lorraine on most platforms, the real Nova Lorraine at I, on Instagram. I do teach AI, so I do have a workshop if you guys are interested in, in diving deeper into how to generate images, you know, what the impact of AI is and, and how you can upskill in that space. And just glad to be here and happy you guys decided to join my workshop today. Any questions? I've got a question. Sure. So you show all of those different platforms. <clears throat> how often do those change when we start to see 
from pitcher and age to stable division, how many different players will come in? Is it every couple of months, or are those the de facto main players? Those are some of the most popular players, but we've seen like Leonardo AI come in on the scene. Um, there's Doodle as well. Every week, there's a whole new set of tools that are out. A whole, a whole new set of tools. Those tools, how about things like Mid Journey, or no, excuse me, uh, uh, Runway ML. Runway is a great video, one. Video tools, mm -hmm. those are starting to creep into the space now too, right? Absolutely. So, text to video is continuing to get better and better. NVIDIA is one of the players with text to video. So, they're behind Runway ML, which is one of the best video generators. They do have some competition now. There is another startup that came into this space. They are typically trained on stable diffusion in terms of a lot of the new players that are coming out, as I was showing you there earlier. But yes, if you are interested in video, Runway ML will give you snippets, but it's a great way to get video content. I got a question over here. How do you make money in this industry? Me personally or anyone with AI? Anyone sitting here, how do we make money with what you showed us? Scale. So if you're an entrepreneur and you want to work remotely, you could take these tools, anything from creating videos automatically and uploading them to YouTube and monetizing videos, creating AI images and uploading them to Etsy and selling those images. Super simple and there's videos on how to do that. So at the low level, you can just scale with content as a content creator and sell whatever you're creating. That's one thing. Two, you can innovate. So you can actually create apps with this very simply. You can create code with the AI and sell that code. You can create images and sell those to brands. You can upskill and take positions in companies like Netflix that was offering almost a million dollars for one role that was an AI-based role. So as an entrepreneur, you can innovate, launch a startup, and we're so, so early or you can scale, create content to support you as a content creator and monetize that. Or you can sell you know, individual products. But it is something where we're going to see those that are upskilled with AI at the very least are going to be those that replace those that are not. So you can be a worker, an innovator, an entrepreneur, a nomad. You can use these tools to monetize, to my knowledge. I mean, if you're interested in fashion, and innovating in this space, there is so much that's needed. Right now, Clo 3D and Browseware are the tools that are used to digitize fashion for production. And even those have problems and issues. Now you're creating a 2D image, and you saw a lot that I created here, that is not necessarily going to be able to be made the way it's shown, right? So you still need technical design skills. You still need someone to interpret that image into what's called a tech pack to then get to a production facility to make it where it actually fits. So there's still a gap there that has not been resolved. So you can 3D model, but you still need someone to interpret the 3D model for it to work when it's sent to a factory or a manufacturer or a sample maker. So that's a need if you want to fill that gap, but it's not yet filled. That was an excellent question. There is an issue between the concept and production. Yeah, excellent question. So there's been some lawsuits that have been presented where artists' works have been used to train the data. Now, if you use AI, typically, you will not see an exact replica of an art piece. Now, it's a, if it's a vector image, you might see something close. But when we're talking about copyrights and humans copywriting, the item has to be, at least within the fashion space, 20% different from the original for it to be able to get a new copyright. So with copyrights and AI, the issue is human authorship. How much did the human, how much were they involved in the creation of this item? So there was a case in New York City with an artist that created a comic book, a full comic book with AI, with Mid Journey version one. Images are, anyway, that's besides the point. But good for them that they were able to do that so early on. They went for the copyright, and the court denied it initially. It was appealed. The images themselves are not copyrightable because there wasn't enough human authorship. The book became the copyrightable product because there was more authorship in the book. 
So right now, AI on its own cannot hold a copyright. If you've been following the, stri the writer strike, part of the resolution is that the writers are going to be involved in editing and manipulating the written scripts that are being produced by the AI. They don't always have to use the AI, that's up to the, that's up to the writer. But if they use it, they're involved in it. So why is that a benefit to the production companies? Now they have human authorship. Now they can own the IP to that item that even if it started with AI, because the human was involved, they can apply for the copyright for that item, which as you know, with TV shows like Friends or movies like Star Wars, that's really important to own the IP. The, yes, the large legacy brands have more access to resources to incorporate blockchain, for example, into their infrastructure. So that is a little more challenging for your independent designers or your smaller companies. The resolution to that, though, is identifying a freelancer or a smaller company that creates with blockchain and collaborate with them. And then together, you can move forward with bringing something to market. As it relates to generative AI, most of those are free and or by subscription. And the subscription price is fairly low, which makes the AI more accessible to more SMEs, small and mid-sized businesses, and freelancers that are for using the AI, where they can build even apps just for $100 a month. You can build your own app, sell it, distribute it, use it for marketing, what have you based on a subscription model. So the AI tends to be more accessible. If you're building your own closed system, that's when it gets more complex in terms of pricing. What a unique opportunity to see somebody talk about one of the hottest industries in the world in fashion and blending it with, I see more AI than blockchain when you talk about it, right? So, so if you had to pick, and it's like picking your favorite kid, if you had to pick one you're more excited about, blockchain or AI, which one would you pick right now? Uh, <laughs> well, yes, it's what I'm using more now. However, the future is the convergence. And as an artist, I am concerned about protection and privacy, and that's where blockchain comes in. So when the hype cycle went away around owning a digital asset named as an NFT just for art's sake and speculation, Okay, fine, move that to the side. But as it relates to protection, privacy. I get it. But, but you're not an old folk like me, okay? So I was around a long time ago when we had something called the word perfect. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember you know, word, word perfect. perfect. No, you're too young. <laughs> so word perfect was one of the first word processing tools. Yeah. And when word perfect came out with spell check, it was yeah. like holy and became a whole industry spell check, and then it became right. a feature. Last one. Does anybody remember before Instagram what Instagram's competition was? It was called his, 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 his And what it was was it was a filter app. You took a picture with your iPhone and you applied a filter to it. And everyone said that was the game changer for filters. They built an entire industry on filters, and then in, Instagram came out and filters were part of it. It destroyed Instagram, okay? Um, Do you think AI is the same thing where you get all these AI companies and all of a sudden now we're seeing AI becoming a feature, not the main lead? So do you think AI will become part of everything as we move forward? Yes. So it's so we have to look at the bigger players like Adobe that's probably doing more with AI because they'll buy up everything and include it or Microsoft or Google as opposed to individual players? Yes and no. I mean, Adobe introduced Firefly, right, where it's a Photoshop on steroids, but Midjourney is definitely the image generator of choice for a lot of creators and a lot of brands. So they're building with Midjourney or Stable Diffusion to create a Midjourney-like product, even though Adobe upped the ante with their AI implementation. Yeah, so I feel like the innovators, the startups, definitely have a fair chance in surpassing some of the legacy brands. Yeah, I, I kind of can I see every major legacy buying all the journey out, buying whoever's out, just buying it or copying the technology. And every two weeks, you know what Moore's Law is, right? Moore's Law, 
Moore's Law means technology doubles in speed every two years and shrinks double every two years. Well, Moore's Law is happening every two weeks in AI. Every two weeks Facts. it's double what it was, right? Yes. Yeah. So we don't know who the players are six months from now, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you then, if anything, you just have to become a prompt master more than anything? Yeah, I feel like getting used to the tool and how it works, because you can apply those skills to any of these tools, right? But understanding it, right? So if you ride a bike, you can now get on a moped or a motorcycle or, you know, a dirt bike or... So you, know, you understand the basics of how to ride a bike and you could take that onward. So I feel that's the same with AI. If you understand ChatGPT, you're going to understand similar programs. Midjourney or Dolly, you're going to understand similar apps and programs. So yes, there will be new players. If you can now find knowing, having used this, when PowerPoint you know, gets introduced or whatever, when all these legacy brands implement their AI version, it's going to be cakewalk because I was trained on the other tools. So either way, I think you can't get away with upskilling if you're choosing to participate in this new digital age. Who here is not using AI? Not be honest, who's not using it? Are you using it? Who is it? Who's using it? Are you using it? Who's not using it? So think about this. Nobody is not using it. Are you using AI? Are you using it? Yes? Is that a yes? Are you using AI? Do you? So everybody is using it. Think about the adoption rate of that. Oh yeah, 100 million? What, in 30 days who's, or who's 60 using, days? Who's still using Facebook threads? Anybody? <laughs> no, right? But think about that. That was the fast adoption of any application was Facebook threads. And nobody's touching it anymore because it didn't do anything. AI is doing something. Absolutely. And if you touch it and you use it, it's hard not to anymore, right? It's hard to go back. You're like, I could do this in seconds? How would you go back? I think the key is balancing though, like I said, the time that you're saving with not creating more work for yourself. Okay. So I think going into it with that is super important. So now the last question, let's predict the future, but only a year in the future. Because to me, that even sounds like so far-fetched. Oh yeah, with AI, 100%. You're standing here a year from today. How will your presentation have changed? What will it change in that year? Augmented reality. Give us an idea, what will change? Okay, so I would have filters. So, there, so with augmented reality, you have anchor points. And I would have you take your phones out if there were no headsets, and you know, Apple Vision might be a, a game player next year. But anyway, let's say no headsets. Take out your phone and I have you point somewhere. And you see a 3D model of one of my designs that I created with AI. And then you can take that, save the QR code on your phone, and then opt to purchase the digital asset on the blockchain, and then choose to swap or trade on your phones among each other. Well, wasn't that NFT two years ago, three years ago? Wasn't it the same thing? Yes, however, with the AR, it's more immersive, it's more real, right? You don't have to go into an open sea or a sandbox or open a wallet. So the user interface is going to be facilitated as well, where it's just like enter your email and now you have access to be able to buy, trade, and swap minted digital assets. Who would do that here? Honestly. You would. You would. Honestly, you would do that. You would go, oh, I want to buy that digital object and keep it in my phone. That's going to have sentimental value to me. Really, you'd do it too. You would want the real and you would want both. Right, she wants both. And that item would exist in the physical as well. See, now I see ticketing working like I'm going to go, hey, I'm a Swifty, okay? I'm going to tell you, I love Taylor Swift, right? I would buy my ticket online and if I could prove that I went to the concert and get memorabilia, I would do that. So let me add to that though. So that digital asset that you bought comes with awards. And so let's say next year with that, you get VIP access when you come back. So I think experiences 100%. It is where the opportunity is. I don't think the asset, because I think you'll do it once, maybe twice, then you go, eh. I think I agree with you. So, so experiences are physical. And you mentioned the physical object, right? It's the physical object or experience that's going to drive the value of the digital. What was happening last year 
was through FOMO, digital value was going up, but it wasn't attached to anything. But now, it's the physical that's gonna drive the digital, and the digital value is gonna go up. Okay, so, I don't know about you, I watch fashion shows and I go, what the heck am I looking at? <laughs> They're not all great. There's some great weird <laughs> stuff out there, right? Yes, so yes. So, the uh, gentleman over here who actually just walked away going, hey, so I don't know anything about fashion, can I make fashion? From what I see of fashion shows, it looks like it's all amateurs <laughs> doing something. Are you saying that maybe we can have the next designer sitting here? Is it possible? In concept, yes. Now, can you make the item that was created? That's a whole nother story. So on, on its own, no. I think, yes, if you type in a few words and you just happen to hit the lucky button and it comes out to a beautiful item that someone wants to wear, you still have to make it a reality and that often will change and if you don't have the expertise either yourself or working with a team it's going to end at that generative image well amazon ha yes amazon is obviously going to get into the blockchain the digital asset game it's already prepping its platform for that so you're going to have your legacy brands allowing it with easier to use interfaces and then going back to your question around monetization and Etsy, you combine that platform with scale. And like I said, if you are a textile designer or you just like textiles, you can use AI to design a print, design 100 prints in, an, in less than well, no, an hour and sell them all and a percentage of those sell on Etsy, you're well on your way to becoming that next Ferrari purchaser. So it is a way to monetize without having to go through the traditional routes of fashion, wholesale, retail, which I lived once upon a time, where you could take it directly to the customer in a way that is much more cost effective. Guys, this is Cuba from Nova. Nova, if people want to find you, where do they go? Yeah. What's the best place? At Nova Lorraine. Connect with me on LinkedIn, the real Nova Lorraine on Instagram. What I suggest is Nova's going to hang out over here. If you have any questions for you and you want to connect with her, she also does workshops. She's here for the week. She's never been to Dubai. So if you want to show her some of the cool places to hang, please, she's definitely please. Here. Okay, <laughs> give it up for Nova, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Good Thank job. you.